All right, welcome to uh, kind of a walkthrough of kind of a, a little lecture, not I guess a walkthrough, I will be kind of doing another mini lecture. So there's really no reading tied to this, um, except there is a supplemental video on Yetta Goodman, who I am using Yetta Goodman as my primary source on her work. Um, I'm kind of establishing um, kind of a, the developmental processes of reading and writing in emergent literacy. So how young children move into being readers and writers. Um, so um, let's get started. Um, also, um, I will be in another video in the submit module, I will be doing a walkthrough for the text set. So in the sub module, I'll walk through kind of the text set rubric and I will show kind of an outline of my possible text set that I'm actually um, creating for a Red Dragon seminar course. So I'll walk you through my thinking and kind of how I'm developing the text set for that class, um, which will help you for the, the major project for module two. So two videos in the sub module, um, but this is the beginning of module two. So I wanted to both introduce the text set and kind of go to start with kind of a a discussion on developmental literacies. Now, since we're secondary education, um, we're only going to spend really this lecture on uh, and the, the previous lecture on language development, working on how young children kind of develop literacies and languages. We talked earlier in module one about languages. Now we'll focus more on uh, literacies or you know reading and writing, the traditional kind of reading and writing of language, which are two aspects of um, language that we we talked about in module one. So, um, without further ado, let's let's get started on uh, developmental literacy. So, before oh, I get into my lecture, I'm going to kind of again we will write into the day. You will add this kind of at the beginning of your uh, discussion thread. Um, if you were in class, we would spend about six minutes writing, and then we would be in small groups sh sh uh, sharing what we wrote. So, um, um, give you a little taste of it of writing into the day, what it would look like in a face-to-face -face class, because I highly recommend doing it, kind of like just kind of use writing to learn to kind of like support students' cognition, kind of like get students to realize that writing is a, a mechanism to support their thinking and learning. So, um, and it's low pressure, meaning it's not something that they would be turning in. However, I do expect them to share um, with, you know, thinking partners or, call, um, to, yeah, thinking partners in class. And then occasionally I do have random, um, equity sticks that I would pull um, and have students share. I do this in my college classes. I did it with my ninth graders um, just because I, I want to ensure question equity and every student should have the equitable chance of actually answering questions in class. Um, so something that you should think about is how you would ensure question equity in your classroom. So, all right. So let me just read it out loud. Take some time to write about an important literacy event, either positive or negative. Now, um, in Yetta Goodman's work, she talks about literacy events um, that influence and shape our views or attitudes towards reading and writing. And literacy event could be a story, just an oral story that um, a caregiver or family member told you. So one of my important literacy events uh, as a young child were my grandfather told me little trickster tales. Um, and so, you know, I when I, I spent summers up there, so uh, every night before we went to bed, he would tell me tricksters, trickster tales. And then, um, so that was an important literacy event, just kind of like visual literacies, kind of like listening comprehension on storytelling structure. Um, and then also my grandparents, but my grandfather and grandmother, um, they were out in the country. There was only one, tele, one television station. This was even before cable, and cable never really... Um, would have gotten out there it's just because it, it was never profitable for a cable company to build cable out there so um, unless you had satellite dish um, and this was pretty satellite dishes days except for the big ones um, my grandparents read so my grandmother read kind of harlequin romance books and my grandfather read westerns which are basically romance books for cowboys i guess um, so um, while they didn't read those books to me because it just wasn't appropriate to read to like a three four year old kid um, I did see them reading, and so and they valued that reading time. So I kind of internalized that uh, reading was something valuable, is something important to do. Um, and also, there is a lot of um, kind of correlation with kind of students' reading achievement and how many texts are in their household. 
um, growing up. So there is kind of this correlation that if we're around readers at a young age, um, we will um, just likely be exposed to more print and more likely to kind of pick up kind of reading even younger than kids that don't have kind of a print a print heavy household, um, which is also why public libraries are so important. So kids that don't have uh, all that book, all those books in their household can get access to all those same books at the library. So uh, support your local library uh, because they are really important um, for developing reading writers. Um, so in this uh, writing into the day, um, I want and and it doesn't need to be a positive reading. You know, negative events. Um, will influence kind of your attitudes towards reading and writing as well. And um, there's research that said that teachers that internalize negative attitudes towards reading and writing will tacitly um, pass that on to students. Students will know that you don't value writing or don't value reading. So two three things, if you have like independent reading time in your classroom, you sit and read with your students. You're not grading, you're not doing anything else. You're gonna sit down and show that reading is valuable so if you're doing that drop everything and read thing um, it won't work unless teachers are reading with their students same with writing um, when I do writing in the day I sit down and write with my students and I will always share I'll be the first one to share and students need to see um, you as a writer see that you value writing into the day and they need to see your writing process you need to kind of show kind of it's messy even you know, just drafting up and writing thoughts so please uh, model that and make reading and writing a, uh, a social activity in your classroom. And this is one way to do that. So here is the how you would set this up. What was the event? And then I have some, yeah, so negative or positive. I have negative ones about teachers reading books in, in, in class, books that I didn't really like. So um, I had negative, um, I had negative experiences with um, certain books. Um, so that turned me into like, I'll be an underground reader rather than reading the books that my teachers are kind of assigned. Um, I started to reject that. So, uh, and it was because of negative uh, reading events, literacy events in the classroom. So where did this, so what was the event? Where did this take place? Who, were, who was with you? So kind of this live relationship, uh, reading and writing is a social act. So me watching my grandparents read, I, I saw them. So that was kind of who was with me. And what did it feel like? And Try to branch out of kind of like just, you know, uh, telling, but showing. So I have my example here. Uh, try showing what it feels like rather than telling what something feels like. For example, I could write, I was happy because I was eating ice cream. That's me telling you that I was happy. But then really good writers will kind of like not tell you, but they'll show you. They'll develop a scene. So the warm air danced across my nose as I reclined on the porch swing, swing eagerly lapping up the cold strawberry ice cream my grandmother just finished making. So I'm showing that you could infer as a reader that I'm pretty happy um, at this point in time. So try doing that. You can even draw a picture. If it helps you get to write, young children use drawing as kind of a pre-writing activity. So you can see those young journals since it's emergent literacy. You see the young children's journal, writing journals. They have the half the pages blank. It's because uh, children need to actually all people should uh, draw it out to help plan their writing. So they'll draw a picture and then you get them to write about what that is and that's planning, they're planning their writing. So you know, that little space is really important for developing young writers. Um, and then again, prepare to share. So you're gonna share this on your discussion thread. So seven, seven minutes, just time yourself seven minutes to do some sustained writing time, develop some writing stamina. So put on a little, clock and time yourself for about seven minutes just writing about this and I'll see you on the next slide. All right, so Yetta Goodman talks about kind of um, some kind of principles of how, uh, literacy principles of how young children, and again, this is a really young age, or this is not a kindergarten, this is like pre-K, three years old, even two years old. We talked about language development, about how young children start developing the phonetics of their language system they're growing up on. Well, they start, re if they're in a language system that has lots of print and words, um, like the K-E-L, Kellogg's and Special K and Red Berries, they're going to start noticing these weird kind of symbols and trying to figure out what is, what is it that they mean. Um, so, um, and early on, they'll start having what they call a relational, relation, what Yetta Goodman calls a relational or semiotic principle. So 
meaning they are starting to understand that these letters and words have meaning and they're starting to have understand that have meaning in the language system that they already are speaking but all these words relate to these words that I already speak and so they're starting oh there's a relationship and then I wrote about my daughter in the uh, in my previous lecture on language development walking down the aisle she demonstrated the relational semiotic principle when she read cereal on the on the special K box and that's her kind of how children progress and start developing the semiotic principle of literacy. So understanding that these words have, they mean something. They're signs that mean something. They have a signification and the signification is to the language that they already are speaking. And so they, they get excited like, oh, I can start reading. And then you says, well, you should encourage. What does it say? Even though they really haven't developed the phonics yet. Um, but you can get them to, you know, encourage them to try to read all oh, and they say, good job. That, yeah, it is. Special K is a serial. Good job. You're a good reader. That type of thing. Um, so that's the relational principle. So in your um, discussion thread, you are going to draw, submit a drawing or um, write a description of another sample of what a semiotic principle would look like. And keep in mind, it's... Um, it's semiotic principle is the words and are related to meaning. So uh, you could you could come up with uh, another way a young child could read some words in a store or library or just, you know at a you know other kind of public or um, like at the mall or in a movie theater that type of thing to to kind of like show that you understand what semiotic principle. So um, draw something up. You can you know, I think you can post drawings um, or um, on the threads or try to see if you can post um, or you can write a description about what the semiotic principle would look like your your example of the semiotic principle all right so let's go to the next principle so another principle that yet a you know, uh, goodman talks about is the functional principle so now these are all principles that young children again developmental wise they'll progress through and these principles will kind of overlap um, as children develop kind of more um, literacy skills into reading and writing in the world. So functional principle, uh, young children will start realizing these words, not necessarily the stop sign, although the stop sign is part of the sign. They will start thinking about these words they see as and the stop sign as a whole, as function. As, there's a purpose, social purpose for this word stop. Uh, so they start realizing all these in, in the world, in a print-centered world, and all these words that are in my language, they, they have a function, they're telling us, they have a social purpose to tell us to do something. And so, and then my daughter driving home from Bugby saw the stop sign and she, you know, she said, that means don't go. So she was like, don't go. So she started to realize that stop, the word stop with the red background has a function to tell me as a driver to stop. And so she's starting to understand the functional principle of words, right? So, um, when you do this um, example, so you're going to create your own example of the functional principle, uh, try to avoid icons um, like everyone uh, go to is kind of other stop signs that are more icons rather than words. Try to find some words that are out there in the world that act, act as a function. Okay, so um, try to steer away from icons or those kind of icons or signs as well. But uh, the function principle STOP together means not don't go so you will come up with your own example and we'll move on to the next principle so um, another principle that yet again man kind of describes is children will start acquiring uh, this is again developmental kind of like the kind of the the, the the development of language they start kind of understanding linguistic principle so linguistic principle starts carrying through in children's writing so remember when uh, Halliday in the social uh, systemic functional linguistics study social linguistics he started un developing young children like ages one start doing that kind of proto language the babbling the cooing um, well young children also in writing kind of develop that kind of proto writing um, a little bit later than the proto language but as they're kind of developing that kind of more uh, the the beginning language that um, children start to develop they start making the connection that this writing that I see 
um, is tied to my language and I can also be a meaning maker. So I will start trying to draw and write and they will follow a scribble stage. So this is kind of the stages, how this is a developmental stage of how children will become um, writers. There are stages of writing. And so they start off with the scribble and the scribble squiggle stage of writing and like language development where a young like, like one year old you know infants and toddlers will start having kind of the phonetics uh, markers of the language they're in the writing system will they'll start scribbling and squiggling kind of mirroring the writing system that they're the language that they're speaking or the language that they're immersed in so um, in a kind of an English or a European with the Roman alphabet system that goes left to right you'll see, see kind of scribble strings going left to right. So the right, the, scrib, the squibbles and squiggles kind of go from left to right. So it does look like a left to right writing system. Um, uh, in studies with Cantonese speaking children or Mandarin speaking children and even Korean where the, the linguist system kind of go, might be up down or more kind of in block character form. Uh, that squiggles will look like uh, Chinese character characters or Korean characters. So um, when I was teaching um, in Korea, I, I, I saw like three to four year old children, their squig squiggles really did resemble kind of the Korean writing system, um, even though it wasn't writing yet, but they are in a proto writing phase. And then as you see, it becomes, they start now recognizing some letters and then they march with some signs, uh, symbols like hearts, and they start doing mock letters. And then they'll start doing, once they kind of understand this alphabet, they just start doing letter strings um, to make words. They know, they know how to write these letters. Now they're going to just try and do letter screen. And then they'll start, oh, there's spaces. So individual letter strings are different words and they'll start labeling pictures with the first uh, onset sound of the word. So sun and camp um, makes sense. Um, and then they'll start kind of more, they'll start copying environmental print. So the print that's environmental, that kind of functional principle print that tells me to do something, they'll start copying that environmental print that they see. So if you have a classroom that's got the, the labels of all the different parts like desk and door and sharpener and pencil, um, they're gonna they're gonna see that they'll start copying that down and so they'll start actually kind of writing this down even though before they really kind of read it um they'll start right doing um copies of environmental print they'll start doing kind of first letter onsets of uh sentences so i have a sister i have a sister so i know they're recognizing the onset sound of each separate word so they're developing a phonemic awareness. And then here is, now they recognize the first sound, the B, and then the, the last sound of the word bear. So now they, and they know what those letters are. So now they're starting to kind of doing initial onset with the ending letter to represent the word. So BR, bear. Um, and then, oops, oops, oops. I see the sky. They start kind of hearing a medial, uh, the sounds uh, and kind of like doing phonetic spelling or invented spelling my and then uh, my nice dress so this is more invented spelling this pumpkin is mine again more invented spelling but get more complicated and uh, invented spelling is an important stage that gets into then leading into more traditional or derivational spelling so it's developmental so if you see like and you see a lot of invented spelling in like kindergarten first or second grade and it's developmental and it, and then kids will and going into third or fourth grade will then do more of the traditional and start doing the derivational spelling meaning they're spelling off of kind of the root words or the prefixes and affixes that they're learning um, but it is a process and it evolves um, and at stages. So this is the linguistic principle. So just start, start kids are starting to understand the writing system is tied to the language that I speak. And I can, and I, as a young person in this language system, I can then create meaning through writing as well. So that's the linguistic principle. So kind of the moving from reading into writing as a part of the student's liter literacy progress, or the young child's literacy progress. So that moves us into kind of some terms. Oh, um, also, um, I'll just go back one second. And we do our poster tag. So in your discussion thread is I want you to uh, come up with a sample of 
you know, what uh, a young child that's demonstrating linguistic principles, something that would look like. And you probably want to do something with uh, sample writing. So maybe try try something that's like this, but not these examples. But you can, you're creative and intelligent human beings. You can come up with a sample like this that um, is not this. If that makes sense. All right. So phonics. So we have phonetics, which is the sound of a language system, the discrete kind of each individual sound of a language of, of words. Um, and now we have phonics, which phonics is the letter sound relay. So the written letter or string of letters or group of letters and the sounds in the language. So it's, the, it's kind of the beginning of decoding the written form of the language. So um, this letter B makes this sound and these two letters TH or make this sound. So um, that's kind of their starting understanding phonics. So they understand this makes a B sound. They understand the TH or the or 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 makes this sound. Okay. So they're starting to uh, develop the pho pho phonics, which is more of the decoding and, and reading the actual written words. So um, on our poster tag, I want you to come up with an example of how a young child would demonstrate understanding of phonics. Now, uh, opposite of phonics is phonemic or phoneme pho phonological awareness. So the, again, these are for phonemes or phonetics, so these are sounds. And so this applies to listening and speaking in the language, but they're really important skills to develop early in children because there's uh, the their phonemic awareness or phonological, phonological awareness is predictable of their later on reading or decoding ability. So it is important uh, process. And so that's why you will see all these type of games in like pre-K, listening, cat, car, how do these words sound the same? What sounds sound the same? Uh, alliteration games, hop, happy, around the onset, the first initial sound. The rhyming words that talk, uh, kind of focus on the end rhyme of a word. And then you have blending activities like k, at, k, at, cat. And you do you get students to blend them together. You've probably seen blending activities on uh, like Sesame Street. That's when the first, my first reading teacher was Sesame Street. And then syllabification, so like clapping with how many syllables, wagon, so you get to how many syllables are in, in the word. And then you have segmentation activities, which are the opposite of blending, so you're breaking a full word out and into the individual phonemes. So hat, ha, at, breaking those apart. And these blending segmentation um, uh, activities are when you, if you're a kindergarten teacher, these are one of the first assessments you will do with your kindergarten students um, as kind of yop singer blending segmentation test. So you get young children to see if they can do this. And again, um, that kind of gives you an, a, a pre-assessment of where they are on developing their reading. So phonological awareness moves into reading, into phonics. So you will, in your discussion thread come up with an explanation of a, how an activity that would develop young child's phoneme, phonological or phonemic awareness. All right, so next we'll talk into kind of um, reading strategies or decoding strategies around this activity called chunking. And what chunking is, is uh, when student, when young kids are learning to read, they start, you can break bigger words apart into smaller discrete sounds that they already know. So for example, a child that doesn't know what brushing is, but they might know, if they know what BR together might sound like, bruh, and then a uh, sound, and a sh, brush, and then ing. And then they can also chunk it in just a, this sound, but, and then they know this word, rush, and then ing. So these are different ways the word brushing can be chunked into the smaller kind of, um, different initial sounds or word families, right? Or sound family or a word family. So BR is a sound family, but rush is a word family. Ing is kind of a word family, um, if that makes sense. So you will kind of pick a different word and try to do a chunking activity that you would probably see, you know, someone in four, you know, four, four years old, five years old, six years old, you know, starting to do the decoding stuff that they would be doing. 
All right, so now we're moving into kind of more of the de derivational and root word analysis, uh, derivational spelling of word families. So this is kind of like when we get our kids going into like, you know, seventh grade and in, in especially in our content areas where we have like technical vocabulary words that are like either Latin or Greek based roots, we, uh, words, we want to kind of start teaching them word families and kind of this derivational spelling, which is not phonetic spelling, you know, invented spelling, they kind of spell how they think it sound, sounds like derivational spelling should be focused on. It's a more mature type of spelling that's focused on the derivational root words of, um, of the word. So, and then you start talking about relationships like telephone, photograph, light, sound, right, distance and then the different words that kind of will mean these. And so these are really great kind of roots that you want to pre-teach your students um, and get them to break down bigger words. So in the sciences, this is really important. So geography can be broken down into different kind of root words, geo meaning earth, graph meaning right, and then afi, the Y ending is a study of. So um, all of the kind of different uh, word families are morphemes, meaning they have a meaning, um, a small unit, the smallest unit of meaning a word can have, and so these are the different morphemes. So, telephone, photograph. Okay. So word families. So, come up in your discussion thread like a short one, you know, two or three, you know, a derivational spelling word family kind of activity. That's a, that the young people that you would see kids doing maybe in a classroom. All right, so poster tag. So this is, if you were face-to-face, -face, I'd have posters all around the room and we'd be walking around in small groups and you'd be doing examples. Not gonna be able to do this in a asynchronous online discussion thread. So you're just going to post it and um, try to like put, post samples of pictures or um, take pictures and post them on your discussion thread. If you go into add additional stuff, you can add um, like images to your uh, threads so you can try that out and I will see everyone in the poster tag and for next time so in this next sub module there's reading so this is kind of a discussion where I just kind of like talk and give you some principles and you kind of de demonstrate your understand basics understanding of emergent literacies um, I want you to now we're gonna prepare start reading Kane chapter one there are some supplemental videos they're really helpful. They're not required. You don't need to put them in any um, annotated bibliographies or anything like that. But all the supplemental mental videos that I do post are very helpful. And they're not really long, but they do support kind of some of the, the big ideas of the, the reading that they're connected to. So uh, read Cain chapter one. I do have a guided notes. Um, so before you read chapter one, pull up the guided notes. It's a Word document at the first, right at the beginning of the submodule. Um, I give the, my face-to-face -face class uh, students the, the guided notes, just kind of one. This is what you might want to do as a teacher is before um, reading something is give guided notes. Um, and I'm actually changing. I, I fixed them. I used to ask questions and I, I don't want to um, ask questions. I just want to kind of like write the idea down and then get students to kind of like find where that is and start summarizing rather than looking for an answer to a question. Uh, it's a little bit kind of more thinking involved with that type of guided notes than just kind of like asking a question as the guided note. So um, that is in submodule two, uh, submodule for this section. Um, so pull it up. Look at it's it's not a very long guided notes, um, but it's a sample of how you could do guided notes. And there's kind of um, a little extra activity at the end that I like to include. So that's next time. I will see you all on this discussion thread and the next one. So take care. And I'm going to now record the TechSet video. So I'll see you there.